59 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security. We will start by acknowledging this meeting is taking place on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. I myself am participating today from the traditional unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nation. Today's meeting is taking place in a hybrid format pursuant to the House Order of November 25th, 2021. Members are attending in person in the room and remotely using the Zoom application. Pursuant to Standing Order 108 sub 2 and the motion adopted by the committee on Friday, February 3rd, 2023, the committee resumed its study of the effects of the withdrawn amendments G4 and G46 to Bill C21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments firearms. Um, today we have two panels of witnesses. We'll deal firstly with the with first one. So for the first hour with us in person or with you in person, we have um, from the Mohawk Council of Kanawaki, uh, Chief Jessica Lazar. Uh, and by video conference, we have from the Gwich'in Tribal Council, we have Grand Chief Ken Kvaychuk, uh, Gwich'in Tribal Council. And I apologize to everyone for misspelling, misspeaking your name. I'll do my best, but uh, thank you. Um, so uh, each of you will have up to five minutes to uh, make opening remarks, after which we'll, we'll proceed with rounds of questions. So welcome, I now invite Grand Chief Kovacic to make an opening statement. Uh, please go ahead, sir, five minutes. Trent Greensy, good afternoon, honorable committee members. My name is Ken Kikovicic, and I am the Grand Chief of the Gwich'in Tribal Council of the Northwest Territories. I was elected in September of 2020 for a four-year term, and I am here speaking on behalf of the over 3,500 participants to our Gwich'in Comprehensive Land Claim Agreement, a modern treaty that we signed with Canada in April of 1992. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee on this very important topic. We, the Gwich'in, are the most northerly First Nations people in North America. We are part of the Athapascans, which includes the Slavey, the Clichon, Hun, Tachoni, Apache, Navajo, and other groups in Canada and the United States. The Gwich'in reside in 11 different communities stretching from the interior of Alaska through northern Yukon and into the Mackenzie Valley of the Northwest Territories of Canada. For a millennia, our Gwich'in nation have lived a nomadic and subsistence lifestyle, largely following the porcupine caribou herd. We coexisted <coughs> with these vital resources by fo following our values of honor, kindness, laughter, our stories, honesty and fairness, sharing and caring, and last but certainly not least, respect. This value of respect is where I'll be focusing my presentation. It is the basis of the perspective of the Gwich'in Tribal Council on the proposed amendments as contemplated through Bill C-21 and the current federal government strategy on firearms. As we are all acutely aware, successive massacres, including a coal polytechnique in 1989, Concordia University in 1992, Vernon, B.C. in 1996, and more recently, Mayor Thorpe in 2005, Parliament Hill in 2014, and Nova Scotia in 2020, resulted in the tragic loss of officers of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and other Canadian citizens. It is the individuals who committed these atrocious murders that are to blame for the senseless acts of violence. Mental wellness, misogyny, and criminal intent were behind these tragedies. However, it was access to some of the firearms specifically mentioned in the draft legislation, such as handguns and automatic assault-style rifles that should concern us all. Therefore, we are of the view that the proposed amendments in Bill C-21 do not go far enough in the license revocations for known or potential assailants through the red and yellow flag laws. Our suggestion would be an automatic 60-day suspension for those with a yellow flag and a 90-day suspension for those that have been red flagged. <coughs> which is particularly important in situations involving domestic violence. Simply put, the Gwich'in Tribal Council supports a restriction of high-powered automatic assault weapons that are generally utilized in military applications. Far too often, some of these weapons have completely overwhelmed the authorities that we depend upon for our public safety. We cannot allow this to continue to happen. This is the very reason I'm here to present today. For our Gwich'in Nation, we need to balance the public interest with the Treaty Crown Partnership that was established with our organization to ensure the continued exercise of our harvesting rights, 
throughout our established territory in the Gwich'in Settlement Region, which totals some 90,000 square kilometers. The essential firearms that we require to exercise our inherent and treaty rights are typically bolt or lever action rifles or pump action shotguns. The rifles such as a 243, 270, 308, 3030, 30 odd six or 6.5 caliber Creedmoor are typically used for larger animals such as caribou, moose or bear, where 12 gauge shotguns are generally used for migratory birds such as ducks and geese. Smaller rifles such as 22 caliber at times semi-automatic versions and 410 caliber or 20 gauge shotguns are used for smaller games such as rabbits, muskrats and grouse. Our people require weapons that are durable to withstand our Arctic conditions that provide protection from foreign objects such as sand, mud and willows, while also being able to be easily transported on snowmobiles or in boats along the expansive river systems of the Nakwichonjik, Mackenzie River, Ted Lit Gwinjik, Peel River, or the Mackenzie Delta, the Northwest Territories. SKS and other long range rifles and semi automatic shotguns have been listed on the proposed amendments from December of 2022. These are common across our communities, specifically the Lee Enfield 303 caliber rifles, which are known as Ranger guns, as they historically have been distributed to our participants belonging to the Canadian Rangers. These specific models will require review as I explained in a call that I participated in with Minister Mendocino on January 31st, along with other Indigenous leaders from across the Northwest Territories. It is some of these models are to be, if some of these models are to be listed under this legislation, then a practical and proper process for a buyback program would be of interest to our participants and communities to compensate for any loss that may result from the passing of this potential legislation. We would also be interested in potential exemptions for certain models that are critical, as mentioned earlier, to Gwich'in hunting and stewardship. We do not question the intent of these amendments. However, there's a clear requirement for continued engagement and consultation with Indigenous nations such as the Gwich'in and more broadly, Canadians at large. People are passionate about this issue because for many Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, the respectful harvesting of this country's natural resources along with the ability to traverse our great lands with pride and safety, constitutes some of our basic needs and human rights, along with those rights enshrined by our treaties or established at common law. There does, however, need to be a proper balance of public safety with our rights to exercise this privilege, to coexist in these habitats that we all call home. Yeah. With that, I'd like to say hi, thank you for your time and opportunity to present today. Thank you, Grand Chief. We go now to... Um, Chief Lazare, for your opening statement, please go ahead. Five minutes, please. Sego sewa guego. Deo justa guate yo jarts. Gahnamage ni duigeno. I am Chief Jessica Lazar of the Mohawk Council of Gahnamage. Yuna kera ziga igas. I'm happy to be here. I'm here to present our position on your proposed bill. We cannot overemphasize how integral hunting and harvesting is to our identity, and today I will present examples of how this bill will affect the ability to express that. There are potential repercussions on our rights to carry out a deeply rooted cultural practice which is already restricted with the existing framework. I will also call in the lack of consultation with Indigenous communities and the effects of this deficiency in creating your bill. Harvesting is deeply woven into the Ganyakehaga Mohawk culture and the fabric of who we are. As Ungwehue, meaning original people, we have inherent practices that we've been engaging in since time immemorial. These practices are deeply ingrained in our ceremonies. They stem from inherent roles and responsibilities that are integrated into who we are from a generational and family level from birth. Six years ago, my son was named Point in a naming Monsieur ceremony. Christin. Point of order. Point of order, Chair. Uh, point of order. I, I'm sorry, who is, who is speaking? C'est Christina, Monsieur. It's Christina, Chair. I'm not hearing any interpretation into French for our witnesses' remarks. Very well. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could look into that. <coughs> yes, yes, one second. Madame Michaud, have you... Uh... Ms. Michaud, can you hear it now? Oui, vous répétez. Can you, would you like it to be, would you like the witness to start over? Yes, if the witness could start over, because it is working now. Thank you. 
I believe it should work now. Uh, merci. <clears throat> so, Chief Lazare, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, start start from the top. Ha, wadu. So, they're just a guate yodrots. I am from Gahnawage, the Mohawk Council of Gahnawage, and I am here to present our position on your proposed bill. We cannot overemphasize how integral hunting and harvesting is to our identity, and today I will present examples of how this bill will affect the ability to express that. There are potential repercussions on our rights to carry out a deeply rooted cultural practice, which is already restricted within the existing framework. I will also call in the lack of consultation with Indigenous communities and the effects of this deficiency in creating your bill. Harvesting is deeply woven into the Ganyagahaga culture and fabric of who we are. As Ungwe Hue, meaning original people, we have inherent practices that have been engaging that we have been engaging in since time immemorial. These practices are deeply ingrained in our ceremonies and stem from inherent roles and responsibilities that are integrated into who we are from a generational and family level from birth. Six years ago, my son was named in a naming ceremony. His name was raised and words were spoken, letting him know that when the time comes, his uncles will teach him our ways and to take on our inherent roles and responsibilities and take him hunting on the land. He has potential to be a father, to provide for a family, and be supported by the other men in his family to fulfill this role. In our culture, we are taught to balance the roles and responsibilities as humans with those of the other living beings here on Mother Earth. All this inherent knowledge and understanding is what we carry day to day. This understanding of our roles, responsibilities, and the respect for the cycle of life is what makes us who we are as Ngwe Hume. This cycle and balance has been interrupted by colonization, which has also established an evolution of our practices, from bows and arrows to firearms, in order to fulfill our obligations in sustaining that balance. At the same time, the development of lands has had, had, has had a cumulative impact on the hunting locations, which are now more isolated, affecting migration paths, which have decreased breeding areas and provides detrimental change to ecosystems. Losing culture through restrictions of our rights is not a theoretical. This loss has been lived in real time by me and my family, as well as my community and those of my sister communities of the Iroquois Caucus. The, the restrictions on our rights under the current licensing structure are already unacceptable, and further restrictions could be fatal to our cultural practices. Urban sprawl and buildup around Gahnawage means we cannot hunt where we live, nor can we travel with our appropriate firearms to hunt in Jowarodu, a hunting territory located in the Laurentians that is shared with Ganasadage. We often must drive many hours and take time off work managing yearly harvest under severe time constraints. This bill and its amendments will further limit the potential for our families to harvest for sustenance during each crucial harvesting cycle. It will impact both our hunting methods and our success rate. When you start to interfere with that success, you interfere with food security and how that person can provide sustenance to their communities and families. In this context and speaking from experience, I know that the possibility of firing successive shots can make the difference between downing an animal that will feed my family through the winter and injuring an animal that may at best take hours to track or at worst result in an injured animal dying in the woods and wasted meat. We understand that some of the firearm prohibitions and suspensions include a sustenance exception requiring that firearms remain available to individuals who demonstrate that they need a firearm to hunt. However, we would like to point out that those exceptions fall short in acknowledging and respecting the reality of the people from my community as well as those from the Iroquois Caucus. The realities of Indigenous people who travel for sustenance harvesting with their firearms are being overlooked due to the lack of consultation. Your government needs to take the time to ensure that there is recognition and acknowledgments made to reflect our Indigenous rights and our realities. Systemic racism in policing is also an issue for many Indigenous communities. Exemptions are only accessible when other law enforcement are properly trained to understand our reality. Impacts of the provincial and federal failure to educate outside police forces are already felt by community members who face problems such as establishing and documenting their rights as sustenance harvesters and transporting firearms for hunting in other parts of Canada. There is no carve-out in Bill C-21 for the exercise of our inherent jurisdiction, jurisdiction rights, nor was any consultation carried out to solicit our input. There is no recognition of the way existing prohibitions and licensing already limit and have adverse impacts on our rights, and no attempt made to help us determine which specifications or models need to be protected, ensuring that there is a balance between safety and sustenance. With this, the Iroquois Caucus requests a meeting with the committee. It is for the Ganyakahaga of Gahnawage, not for Canada, to decide what is fitting for our people. 
we have entrusted enforcement to the Gahnawage peacekeepers. I'd also like to point out that this bill will place an administrative burden on our peacekeepers who already face chronic underfunding, understaffing, and intransigence regarding our proposals for culturally appropriate firearm control. Concurrently, the lack of in-depth and comprehensive consultation with Indigenous communities is demonstrated in the incoherence and inconsistency of this bill, the proposed amendments therein, and the lack of acknowledgement on the rights of Indigenous peoples. The retracted amendments would have prohibited a broad spectrum of hunting rifles, shotguns, and other long guns used by our hunters. And evergreen definitions may not be any better. They would curtail our ability to access new developments in firearms, as other, witness have, other witnesses have already pointed out. Even a cursory review of the retracted amendments reveals important inconsistencies in the firearms selected for the inclusion. So you see, when you talk about firearms as objects, you forget that it's the person holding it that it that makes it either a tool for sustenance or a weapon. We ask that you address the real underlying problems that cause gun violence, not further restrict Indigenous peoples from carrying out their lives in a sustainable, ceremonial, and generational way. Find a way to support firearm safety training, find a way to support awareness against gun violence, and address the mental health issues that lead to gun violence. Help in Our demonstrating that when handling the please. power of a firearm comes great responsibility. Tony Wanaga. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we will start <clears throat> our rounds of question uh, now with uh, Mr. Motts. Mr. Motts, please go ahead, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Chief Lazar. I think that's uh, probably one of the best uh, testimonies that's honest, real, and uh, speaks to the issues that, that we have been talking about with this bill. So thank you uh, for, for that uh, plain look at how it impacts you and your community. I want to take you back to a comment you made early on in your introduction about um, basically your Indigenous exemptions under the or the Oregon Council that came in in May of 2020. Now we know that uh, this government is particularly bad at legislation, and now I understand that you know they, they, Liberals will sometimes say the right thing, but making it happen is a different uh, different issue when it comes to actually getting the job done. So, case in point, the Oregon Council of May of 2020. Uh, took away indigenous firearms that were used for sustenance hunting. Um, and then they prayed, the Liberals prayed out this exemption that they talked about, uh, an amnesty, if you will, uh, respecting indigenous rights under Section 35. Now, the lim there's limitations of that, however, and, and, and you t touched on it briefly. And I just, I just want to, I won't read the whole thing, but one of the things that the excerpt talks about in the actual act talks about the if specific firearm was on April 30th of 2020 non-restricted firearm used it for hunting in the exercise of a right recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the act of a constitution act of 1982 or sustained uh, sustenance hunting the person or their family they can use that firearm until they are able to obtain another firearm for that use which is really to me um, you know, it, it seems to be a cop out the liberals are really uh, you know, they give you a juicy talking point. There's no substance that it violates, to me, it potentially violates Section 35 with that little, you know, one little short sentence in there. And it puts Indigenous hunters at risk for being criminalized if they're caught with a firearm when they could have possibly, cha you know, taken a prohibited firearm previously now and not bought a new one. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How, how do you address that with your community? And have your Indigenous hunters from your community uh, address that as a concern to you? So it definitely is a concern, as I brought it to it today. Um, anyway, I was only given five minutes to speak on it. Um, however, when it comes to the criminalization of these weapons, like I've mentioned, it's really difficult to prove that we have the right <clears throat> to the weapons. The, the permitting, especially in Quebec, for my community it's located in Quebec, the permitting is not consistent. It is non-functioning at this moment. I know that there are a few of them waiting for their pals, waiting for different uh, different permits in order to hold different weapons. And also, the I guess the essence of uh, family hunting as well. So there's limits as well on the kind of gun that you can have or the kinds of gun or the numbers of weapons that you can have. So if families go hunting together, they cannot travel together because there are limits with that. And it, it affects the day-to-day 
I am day to day, but the the present practices that we have in hunting. And I also uh, thank you for that. I also appreciated the um, um, your explanation in regards to how the act, uh, it, as proposed in C twenty one, really doesn't impact public safety. It, it goes after the wrong issue it impacts your community as indigenous hunters it impacts you know uh, sport shooters and and uh and hunters uh, and farmers across across the country and you know one of the things that that i have seen recently is the government in quebec is spending you know some money to deal with some of those issues that they find to be the problem the real problem which is smuggling from across the U.S., uh, from the U.S. into into Canada, and they're spending, you know, over $6 million over a number of years to try and make that happen. Um, you know, and, and, and the, the Minister of Public Safety in Quebec talked about the money that w will make that region safer. So I know that uh, we've talked, uh, you know, a lot in this committee and in the House about, you know, if we really wanted to impact public safety, we needed to close some of the, the, the porousness of our border and provide resources there at our border to, uh, to impact uh, the illegal smuggling of firearms into this country and uh, rather than going, you know, spending the resources going after law-abiding Canadian firearm owners, including Indigenous communities, who are not public safety risks. So how, how, do, you see, how do you see what this Quebec initiative is doing and, and any suggestions you may have from, from your nation and to 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 uh, the federal government on what we need to do to seal up our borders to stop the illegal smuggling of firearms in this country, which is a significant problem as identified by law enforcement across the country. So, in speaking with Minister Mendocino, I think it was two weeks ago, I had um, I had mentioned that the perspective of the federal government is on the weapon itself as being the killer. And I had made it clear to him that his position on that was different than ours, that we see the person behind the weapon itself. As for the border issue, I think that a more, um, more resources and funding should go to investigative approaches to the, I guess, the smuggling ring, <laughs> if you would call it that, and more education and more funding on the expertise and uh, funding towards policing. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Mutz. Oh, that already? Yeah, it's, I just uh, got warmed up. <laughs> I just got warmed up, Chair. Well, maybe you'll get a chance in the next uh, next okay. round. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we'll go now to Mr. Moff, please. Mr. Moff, six minutes. Thank you, and and I'd like to um, I'd like to begin by thanking both of our witnesses for being with us here today. Um, your testimony is very important to to our work to determine what to do next on, on, uh, on assault weapons. Um, my first question is for, for you, Grand Chief. Um, well, actually, for both of you. Um, Mr. Motts had mentioned the order in council um, and that there was an amnesty uh, for Indigenous peoples exercising their Section 35 hunting rights. Um, I'm just wondering if, if there is... Um, if there is uh, something brought forward dealing with an assault weapon ban, would you support something similar uh, that would exclude Indigenous peoples from that ban? So maybe I'll tr start with you, Chief Lazar, and then we can go to you, Grand Chief. So in terms of the assault rifle ban, I'm going to be a, extremely honest. I'm not completely privy to all the different types of weapons that there are listed. I'm not privy to the, are completely aware or completely understanding of the different types of weapons. However, I would not be able to answer questions like that based on the fact that we have not had the opportunity to consult across the Confederacy, across from the Iroquois Caucus. So answers to that question is required with further consultation. Okay, thank you, that's fair. Um, I, I guess... Maybe if you can take it, take it back. My, my thinking is that anything that we did would exclude indi Indigenous peoples who are using their, their um, firearms for um, hunting. So, um, uh, Grand Chief, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, of course, we need to understand the details behind this, but uh, as I stated in my opening comments, we would support any restriction on high-powered automatic assault rate weapons that are generally used in military applications, for example. I listed out the common firearms that we utilize in our territory of the Northwest Territories and the Yukon of Canada. And I did that by design so that people can see the types of weapons that we do require to exercise some of our Section 35 rights, but also those that have been enshrined in our modern treaty. With that said, we know our lifestyle and our subsistence harvesting will evolve in accordance with our rights. So what I have declared as the common weapons today, rifles primarily and shotguns may change over time. And we just need to be cognizant that any changes in our harvesting practices to keep up with technology and conservation, keeping in mind our subsistence way of life is not infringed unnecessarily by any future bans on these types of weapons. Thank you, Grand Chief. I wondered if you could clarify something for me. Um, my colleague, Mr. Lloyd, just tweeted that in your testimony, you said the bill is targeting hunting rifles. Does that accurately depict what you, what you said? That's not what I heard. No, no, it's, it targets some that we use that we do need to have further discussion and engagement on. But as we understand it, a lot of the weapons that, that, and rifles that we use are not mentioned specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, wondered, um, I wondered if you could expand on red flag for us. Um, we had uh, testimony from um, women's groups who were opposed to red, the red flag provisions in the bill, and I noted that you said that you were supportive of them. Um, I myself am supportive of them because it's one more tool that we can offer for uh, women. Uh, it's not perfect, but I'm just I'm just wondering if you could perhaps expand on that. And if I have time, uh, Chief Lazar, I'll also go to you. Well, because of the prevalence of subsistence harvesters in our community, there's there's ease of access to firearms, and when we do have situations of domestic violence, whether it's perpetrated by men or women, it is a concern, especially when you're in northern remote communities with limited police support. And so it is that view as well as experiences that I am aware of that uh, some of our people, especially our women, have had when they are in these types of situations and their health and safety is at immediate risk. There does not seem to be enough action swift action taken to protect these individuals so that they are not fearing for their lives as they're putting themselves and their children to sleep. And that is the view that we look at this, that it's an automatic rescindment so that uh, there is the time that is able to have the proper assistance provided to the impacted families and the assailants themselves, because clearly there is something at risk going on that needs to be addressed. So I only have about 30 seconds left. Chief Lazar, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that provision or not, the red flag provision in the bill. Okay, so I will answer as brief as possible. <laughs> I do believe that there is a little bit of give and take in terms of that red flag provision. I know that there's pros and cons. However, when it comes to the systemic racism that, systemic racism that we have in policing, there's a lot of issues that need to be fixed before we can consider things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moff. On y va maintenant. We're now going to turn to Ms. Michaud. Please go ahead. You have six minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for having come to before the committee today. It's truly much appreciated. And I'm going to start with Ms. Lazar. I understand from your testimony today and from a press release that uh, you published and also a letter you sent to our chair and to the Minister of Public Safety that you have opinions about the spirit of the bill. There are good and uh, bad impacts and I, from what I understand, there will be impacts on your community. So, 
I guess I'm wondering if your position is about G4 and G46 that were withdrawn, or is it about the whole bill? Essentially about the whole bill. I think it's important if, like I mentioned before, that the lack of consultation is one of our major concerns. So if given the opportunity, we would give you a comprehensive perspective of our lived realities. It would allow your government to balance your perspectives without having an adverse impact of Indigenous peoples being able to hunt and harvest. An opportunity should be required to allow us to deliberate on the common threads between our nations in order to give you um, a more in-depth description of any special exemption or any required amendments that we would like to have or like to see. Um. Uh, from what I understand, there has been a lack of consultation. You didn't meet Mr. Mendocino, didn't you? And Mr. Oh. Mendocino, that was on February 22nd, 2023. That was, I think, about a week or two after we sent the letter. Okay. And was your conversation beneficial? Did it provide any clarity or did it calm any concerns you might have? It was beneficial in a way that we got to meet face to face. He got to see where we were coming from as a council and not only discuss it with just one individual, but to speak with the whole of the council and to get a little bit of um, our experience. However, I do not deem that as adequate consultation. Thank you. Si je reviens à la position sur. Now I'd like to come back to your position on the bill. You were asked questions by my colleague Ms. Damoff and you said that perhaps there hasn't been enough information about the list in terms of what is allowable or not, what will be on the banned list, what is acceptable. So I'm just trying to understand, are you against if you're against the bill, does that mean you're against parts of the bill? Or I'd like just to hear you expand on this somewhat. For example, what firearms exactly will your members use and you'd like to see exempted, for example, from any kind of prohibition? How, generally speaking, how do you perceive this, this list? I. I understand that not everyone will be happy with this bill, but we're holding these extra meetings in order to try and find solutions or in order to at least try and do better than the first time. So I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations. Uh, of course, uh, your main message seems to be that there has to be better consultation, especially amongst those who are going to be directly impacted by this bill. But besides that, do you have any specific recommendations to make? I don't have any specific recommendations to make because we weren't provided an opportunity to be able to delegate or discuss between ourselves as nations to be able to answer that. The governance that we work and the framework that we work in is not necessarily um, a party kind of uh, governance framework. It's um, a more consensus-based framework where we all have differing opinions, we all have differing um, perspectives and realities. And like I said, if, you, if given the opportunity, we would be able to have, or given the opportunity for the time to be coming together and creating that list of exemptions so that we can find the common threads, threads that we can suggest to amend in this bill. So I can't speak on behalf on one person. I am representing the Mohawk Council of Gahnawage, but I cannot speak on behalf of other communities, essentially um, other indigenous communities. However, I've been given the go-ahead to speak on behalf of the Iroquois Caucus, which feels the same way that I do in regard to the lack of consultation and the lack of timing that we have for consultation. It requires a lot of time and a lot of energy that I, I'm sure that uh, governments usually don't have the... Um, or that I've witnessed they don't have the patience for or the understanding that there's a lot of um, a lot of different factors to consider in terms of that. Thank you. Perhaps I can ask you about something else that caught my eye in your letter. Uh, you said on the shoulders of the peacekeepers who safeguard our territory and will increase the potential for discriminatory and over-policing of our people of territory. 
Could you expand on that, please? Could you tell us about the the, the extra work that that might impose on your peacekeepers? So as I've mentioned, we do have hunting territory that is in the Laurentians, about an hour away from our community. So the peacekeepers are our entrusted enforcement for the community of Gahnawage as well as Jowarodu. So we have to travel an hour away to, in order to get to that territory. However, within that hour, if you start criminalizing um, criminalizing some of, like, enforcing the gun restrictions, that hour from Gahnawage to Jowarodu is an hour that someone is risking when they bring up their weapons to that hunting territory, an hour that they're risking. So we have our own jurisdiction in Gahnawage. That jurisdiction applies to Jowarodu, but there is, because of colonization, because of developments, that we are separated an hour away and that we are not connected to that territory, and we cannot hunt in our territory as well. Thank you. Uh, merci, Madame Michaud. Thank you, Ms. Michaud. You, Mr. Julian. Uh, Mr. Julian, go ahead, please. Six minutes. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses, uh, Grand Chief, Chief Lezao. You're offering a valuable te testimony today uh, that I, I think will help our committee uh, look to path the, tr tracing a path forward. And I'd like to start with you, Chief Lazar, just to uh, understand the issue of the lack of consultation that you flagged in your presentation. You said that you'd met with the minister on February 22nd. Um, prior to that was the Mohawk Council, was the Iroquois uh, Caucus consulted in any way about this legislation? And if not, okay. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Yep. And if not, uh, when was the last time uh, there was uh, any approach from the federal government uh, on on firearms legislation? Not none that I'm aware of right now. I am new to the Iroquois Caucus, so I am still getting briefed on the different um, files that they've taken on. But based on the previous discussions, they're not necessarily addressing Bill C-21 or haven't been addressed for Bill C-21 as of yet. So uh, prior to February 22nd, there, there just was no consultation. The federal government didn't come to you in any way, uh, either the council or the caucus, to uh, ask your, your views on the legislation? No. Okay. Uh, you have spoken very eloquently about the, the amendments uh, that, uh, and the NDP certainly shared your concerns about, about the amendments. We, we pushed procedurally to have them withdrawn. Now, on the principle of the bill around the handgun freeze, is there something, is that a, a position that either the Mohawk Council or the Iroquois Caucus have taken around the, the principle of a freeze on handguns? No, not, no. Okay, so you have no, no position on, on that? No. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's very good to, to know. Thank you. Uh, I... Uh, wanted to come back to the issue of um, uh, transporting firearms from, from your community and, and the issue of the impacts on peacekeepers as well. Is it your impression that, that the way uh, firearms legislation is implemented currently, that it, it makes it difficult for law enforcement, in this case the peacekeepers, to actually enforce the legislation? Yes and no. It's difficult to explain that we have jurisdiction over our community and that we have exemptions within our community. It is difficult to, um, I don't know how to word this, <laughs> to be honest. It's a, it's a yes and no question, answer I mean. It's very, for the peacekeepers, they are community members as well. They are hunters as well. But to manage what happens as soon as somebody leaves our territory, it leaves Gahnawage, say, to go to Jowarodu, say, to go to another nation's territory or another hunting ground uh, as a guest of that nation, it's out of the hands of the peacekeepers. Yeah, okay. So there are challenges, but within the community of Gahnawage, the peacekeepers are understaffed and they are underfunded in order to be able to execute what needs to be done. Okay, th thank you for that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to the Grand Chief. Uh, thank you for being here today. 
I'd like to ask the same question around uh, consultation. Has the Gwich'in Council uh, consulted uh, in any way prior to the legislation coming forward or prior to the amendments coming forward uh, or after the amendments were tabled? Uh, before the amendments, no. After, yes. We had one meeting with Minister Mendocino at the end of January. Okay. Uh, but, but prior to that, there, there was no consultation. Thank, thank you for that. I, I'd like to uh, ask you the same question in terms of the, the principles of the bill uh, around the, the freeze on handguns. Does the Gwich'in Council have a position on that? Uh, you've raised some uh, very valuable uh, additional testimony that I, I'd like to come back to, but on the, on the principle of the bill itself, the handgun freeze. Um, do, do you have a position? Well, we struggle to see why anyone would need handguns in our territory other than for crime-related purposes. So you'd, you'd broadly be supportive of the handgun freeze? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in, in your testimony, you pointed to the uh, weaknesses of the amendments, uh, certainly, and, and I, I think that's something that... Uh, We've come to a consensus on uh, as a committee, uh, but you also mentioned the issue of of exemptions, and uh, could you give us a sense of of what you feel uh, the exemptions should look like, uh, what it would affect, um, what your overall approach or the approach of the Gwich'in Council would be in terms of an exemption on this legislation. Well, we're, we're of the view it could be a somewhat slippery slope. So the reason we have provided this testimony is to indicate specifically which models of firearms that we want to ensure is not on such a list, such that we don't need an exemption, that these firearms are not on any list that is restricted by the government of Canada for those that have been approved uh, or licensed to be able to have them. That's our position. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, you're going to give me an extension. That's Sorry. great. Um, no, 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 I'd be more than pleased. Or are you cutting me off? I was cutting you off, but I was muted. I, I had all this eloquent stuff where I thank you and all, but I was muted. So you're, you're, you're going to be missing that. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Julian. We'll go now. We'll start our second round with uh, Mr. Shipley. Five minutes, please. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Point of order. On a point of order, go ahead. Um, given the time, are we doing full rounds or are we going to uh, truncate? I think with this will be an abbreviated round. I think we'll have four slots, uh, one for each party. Yeah. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Shipley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for witnesses for being here today. Uh, my first question is going to be for uh, Chief Lazar. Lazar, the Minister of uh, Public Safety recently had some meetings with your community. And it was reported in the local uh, media on February 24th. There was some quotes from a member of your community, Bobby Patton. Not sure if you're familiar with that gentleman or not, but you're nodding your head yes. I'm going to read these because I don't want to misquote them because this is really interesting what he quoted here, and I'll ask your comments on them. This was what Mr. Patton said. It's not like hunting back in the olden days where animals were plentiful, easy to get. He noted the hunting grounds have shrunk as development has intensified and populations have grown, increasing the need for efficiency in hunting. If you want to go out and you want to kill one goose, one shot, one kill, perfect, he said, invoking those who are hunting for sport. However, he insists that goose hunters targeting the animals for sustenance depend on more aggressive weapons to yield enough meat. They all depend on their semi-automatic weapons. One shot you're not going to get much from, he said. It's going to limit the amount of harvest it's going to bring back to the community, to the people. It's going to lead to a lot of people probably starving, said Mr. Patton. Could you elaborate on that? That's quite a comment by Mr. Patton, that people will be starving. So a lot of our community members are trying to go back to their original ways or our original ways, and a lot of our community members do live off of the hunting game that they uh, are successively hunt. So there's moose meat, deer meat, there's geese that I know of that I've tried. <laughs> and the rest that I haven't tried, there's beaver. There's so many different, um, I guess, so many different game that I use for sustenance. 
and a lot of families do rely on that. They prefer not to go to the local IGA. They prefer not to go to the local metro or local grocery stores. They prefer to hunt and harvest their own game and their own um, pro produce their own produce within their gardens and greenhouses. Thank you for that. Obviously, it would be quite an impact if this, I know it's been rescinded and taken back, but if these amendments went through, it's very tough to think that people could potentially be starving because of this incident. Uh, not my quote, my members across, that was actually the uh, Bobby Patton, the member of this community. So you can laugh and comment all you want, but you can call him if you want. So my second question is for uh, the Grand Chief. Um, Grand Chief, you mentioned that um, you're for the handgun ban. It's, I just want to get some clarification. We had uh, the Fur Institute of Canada uh, in a meeting, and we've heard from other trappers also, that trappers use, quite often for their own safety, handguns. Do they not use them up in, in your area? Um, we're hearing conflicting reports on this. No, the use of handguns, especially those that are trapping, is not common. It's not common, but is it used at all? We had heard that safety issues, because they're carrying so much gear, they went into great uh, depth of detail on it, that they needed to have a, a handgun on them for many times for safety reasons. You've never heard of that up in your area? Being raised by a trapper and uncles who were trappers, and myself being raised in a traditional camp, I have never seen a handgun utilized by our people. For okay. That purpose. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to go back to Ms. Lazar. Ms. Lazar, uh, in December, the Assembly of First Nations unanimously passed a resolution to publicly oppose Bill C-21 on the basis that amendments introduced by the government could potentially criminalize long guns for rifles used by First Nation peoples in exercising their Aboriginal treaty rights to sustenance, hunt, and harvest. Do you share these concerns? Absolutely. And uh, Grand Chief, do you also share these concerns? Can I get you just to reiterate the question again? I was just asking if you agree with the Assembly of First Nations in actually passing uh, the resolution to oppose Bill C-21. No, we are not in agreement with that resolution. Okay. Could you explain why that is? For the reasons that I outlined in my testimony, we believe that this legislation is required and we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We do need to... We certainly need some consultation on this, but there are some interesting components and aspects of this legislation, particularly those around handguns, restrictions around those, and the uh, red and yellow flag conditions, as well as a lot of the, uh, the rifles are that are listed on the uh, proposed legislation. 20 seconds, sir. Uh, 20 is not really enough to ask a question, so I'll pass that along. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shipley. We're going now to uh, Mr. Nur Mohammed. Uh, five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for making your time making uh, time to be with us today. Uh, Chief Lazar, I'd like to start with you. Can you share with us what the impact of the 2020 uh, OIC was on your community? The order in council, the 2020 order in council. Sorry, there's so many acronyms in my job. I just Sorry. forget what they are. Um, so. <laughs> the impacts, I cannot reiterate this enough, that there is extreme systemic racism in policing. And when you don't train the officers federally or provincially with the rights of Indigenous peoples, those rights get overlooked on an individual basis in real life practice, when an individual from my community or any indigenous community is stopped and trying to exercise their right, the officer at hand is not trained properly in how to deal with that matter, is not aware of that matter, and is not informed of that matter. What I'm trying to understand though, and I, and I agree with you, I think it's really important that all our law enforcement are, are well aware of, of, of the challenges that your communities face. What I'm trying to understand though is given that there was the carve out specifically for indigenous communities in the OIC, in the order in council in 2020, I'm trying to understand what the specific impact, if any, was um, on your community. And if there wasn't one, uh, then I guess the question I would ask is, would a similar carve out be helpful to you in any future, um, or in C21, for example? Can you repeat the question? 
Yeah, so what I'm trying to understand is if, you know, given that there was a specific carve out in the order in council in 2020 that protected the rights of indigenous communities to continue to hunt, um, would something like that in C21 not address your concerns given um, hopefully that there was no impact in, uh, from 2020? No. So it wouldn't, so I'm trying to understand that there, what, if there was no impact in 2020, why would a similar provision now um, cause concern? There, there is an impact. I, I, I don't understand. I don't how to. I don't know how to explain this. I'm sorry. I'm tripped up for words, but there is an impact in terms of the awareness. I know you're saying that the enforcements are aware. They are aware of our struggles. They are aware of the challenges. They are not properly educated. And they are not properly trained. Okay. No. That, that's I, that's the challenge. You can say all you want, you can put it in legislation that there's exceptions when it comes into practice, that's where the challenge really lies. So the issue is in the implementation of the legislation? Is implementation that... and also the resources. Got it. Okay. So, uh, okay. That, no, that, that's helpful to know because I think it helps, helps us understand some of the challenges around this. Uh, Grand Chief, if I can ask you the same question, what were the, uh, what were the concerns or what were the um, impacts on your community uh, following the 2020 order in council, if any? I'm not aware of any impacts. Uh, and would similar, uh, if there were a similar carve out or a similar exemption for indigenous communities in C21, um, how would you feel about that? Would that be helpful? Well, I think we need to understand the weapons that have been identified. And uh, as I stated earlier, for this to be proper legislation, I we would need to discuss what these potential exemptions would be. And uh, from our perspective, we could certainly share the, the rifles and the shotguns that we typically use by our people, such that there is no need for an exemption and that they are not on the prohibited listing. And, you know, in your, in your answer to my, my friend, Mr. Shipley, you had talked about the importance of making sure that this legislation did get passed. You, you used the term, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think you're right. I think all of us recognize that there is a lot of, there, there was room for improvement. And I think that that is a very, very important premise for why we are having the conversations. Can you explain to us why for your community this legislation is important and why it's important for us to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and come to a good outcome? Well, we're starting to see an increased prevalence of, of drugs and illicit activity in our communities. Like a lot of Indigenous communities across the country, gangland violence is a concern. And some of the weapons that have been listed on this potential legislation are often carried by these individuals. They are used to incite fear, intimidation, and ultimately compliance amongst our people. So looking forward into the future, any legislation that looks to restrict some of these assault automatic weapons that are typically military in nature need to be removed because as we look towards things like potential self-government for our Gwich'in region, we need our police forces to be able to have the, the, the equipment and the weaponry to be able to combat some of these uh, criminals. Thank you, Mr. Nurmohamed. Uh, Ms. Michaud, you have two and a half minutes now. Thank you very much, Chair. And Grand Chief, I'm going to pose questions to you now. You spoke about semi high capacity, semi automatic firearms. Can you tell us what you mean by that? I think at least 90% of the listing of, of some of the um, rifles that have been listed on the proposed legislation. There's, there's many of them on there. Um, not going to get into specifics at this particular juncture, but I said assault style automatic weapons. And we do use some semi-automatic uh, rifles, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony. And I want to be clear of the, of the delineation between the fully and the semi-automatic weapons. Donc, ce serait les armes semi so we're talking about The, the ones that you would like exempted would be the ones that you commonly use for hunting then. Okay. Merci. Vous avez mentionné également dans... You also said in your opening remarks that you support a buyback program for prohibited firearms. 
were you referring to assault style fire, firearms or handguns or both because I know that the government promised to implement a mil military style firearm buyback program but we're not aware of anything involving handgun buyback so in terms of a buyback program, would you want that to apply to assault-style weapons as well as handguns? The buyback would only be in force for a lot of the rifles that have been prohibited or deemed prohibited under potential legislation that are used for subsistence harvesting by our people. There will be some instances where individuals are in possession of restricted firearms if the previous Bill C-21 was to be passed. It is in those instances that we would look at a buyback program. When the government ended up consulting you, I believe you said it was on the 31st of January that you met Minister Mendicino. Was this discussed, any, a buyback program? Yes, it was, along with other leaders from across the Northwest Territories. Uh, there was a, at least a couple that had mentioned uh, support for this type of, uh, of a program. Merci, madame. Thank you. To Mr. Julian. Mr. Julian, you have the hammer. Two and a half minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Chair. Um, Grand Chief, I I'd like to follow up on Madame Michaud's questions around the BIPAC. Uh, you would mentioned in your testimony, and I'm paraphrasing you, but basically important to have a properly done BIPAC program. Uh, were there it, was it discussed with the minister or does the Gwich'in Council uh, or yourself, do you have recommendations around how a buyback program should be structured uh, so that it, it meets the needs of Indigenous peoples? Not at this time and can be the focus of some of our discussions on continued consultation on this potential legislation. Okay, thank you. Uh, you'd also mentioned the, the issue of uh, uh, gangland violence, which is something that we're facing uh, everywhere. We've, we've seen a marked increase, and law enforcement has seen a marked increase in the, the use of uh, ghost guns, untraceable um, 3D printers can put them together. Uh, using firearm components, um, they can produce a, a, a deadly weapon that is uh, untraceable. Uh, do you have concerns about the, uh, the use of ghost guns? And is, is this something that, that you feel the government should be taking more seriously as well? Well, I'm not um, particularly familiar with ghost guns. Uh, I'm only hearing about them recently. But nothing really surprises me anymore with the artillery that's being used by those that are perpetrating um, the drug, uh, that, that, that do operate in the drug world and are making its way into our more northern and remote communities. Yeah, but you, you, it, you, you have, um, it, uh, locally you have seen uh, some of the, the same concerns uh, raised or you've actually seen the production of ghost guns or the sale of ghost guns in the same way that in, in uh, some of our regions uh, of the country, we've, we've seen a, a marked increase. And this is certainly something law enforcement has, has flagged as well. So is it something that is of concern to you? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, you'd mentioned as well the issue, I've only got a few seconds, but the military-style military weapons. Uh, do you believe the manufacturers uh, should also bear some responsibility when it comes to uh, the, the, these types of weapons uh, being present in Canada? Yeah, I think, uh, as I stated earlier, there's clearly a need for broad-based uh, consultation with, with all Canadians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, and that includes manufacturers who, who are stakeholders to this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Julian. So that wraps up our questioning for this panel. I would like to thank our witnesses, Grand Chief Kiakovic. Kikovicic. Kikovicic. There you go. We'll bring you back and I'll practice more. Kikovicic, thank you. And, uh, and uh, Chief Lazare, thank you very much for your, for your time today it's, uh, and for helping us in our, in our study. 
And with that, we will suspend and we're going to bring in the next panel. Thank you. So welcome to our new panel. So with us today, by, by video conference, we have as an individual, uh, Ms. Linda Keiko, Olympian. Uh, we were supposed to have Dr. Simon Chapman. However, he had some difficulty with his uh, uh, equipment and is not going to be able to participate. He will um, send a uh, brief, I understand. Um, we also have uh, from the Fédération Québécois des Chasseurs et des Pêcheurs, Mr. Monsieur Marc Renault, President, Madame Emily Vallée, Communications Coordinator. So each group will have uh, up to five minutes for opening remarks, and after which we will start our uh, our questions. Uh, we'll start now. I would invite Ms. Uh, Keiko to make an opening statement of uh, up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Linda Keiko. I'm a two-time Olympian in the sport of pistol shooting. I'm also the president of the Alberta Handgun Association, which is an organization that fosters and promotes the ISSF, otherwise known as Olympic style of competitions. I come from a family of Olympians in pistol shooting. Both my father and one of my sisters were both Olympians. I am very grateful for this opportunity to appear before the committee today. However, I'm also very angry and I'm also sad. I'm angry that my tax dollars are being wasted on policy that doesn't increase public safety. I'm angry that no matter how well I follow the law, the laws keep changing and the law changes are impacting me directly and people like me. I take great, great pride in representing my country on the world stage, as do all athletes. And I'm sad that due to the handgun ban, the order in council C71 and this proposed legislation that I will not be able to represent Canada on the world stage that athletes who come after me won't even have an opportunity to compete as they will have no access to competition firearms. I am angry that this government has no concern for actual safety because if there was concern for safety, if there was actual effort made to increase public safety, I likely would not be here as a witness. And that because of your measures, um, it, because if you had interests of public safety in mind, the measures that you did would not affect me as a vetted firearms owner. Your measures would then affect criminals. None of that I could see of that's being proposed in C21 or the withdrawn amendments made measurable improvements for public safety. Criminals have criminal behavior and no matter what the law says, criminals will continue doing what they do. Instead of reducing crime, your handgun bans, ordering councils and efforts to virtue signal that you're doing something increase my paperwork by six weeks to represent Canada on the world stage. I now pay the government for the privilege of returning home with my guns, which are my property, on every return home to Canada. The extra paperwork I do does not make you, my community, or my children safer than they were before your measures were put into place. But it is a waste of my tax dollars. Instead of preparing to compete against my peers from the Ukraine, Greece, South Korea, France, among many others, I'm doing paperwork for the privilege of not being arrested or having my competition comp equipment confiscated at the border when I return home. These measures also remove any opportunity I have to take up hunting, something that my father did that is inherently a Canadian tradition. Not only do I need to have my pal, I need to take a hunter safety course and plan out details of where I would hunt. Banning semi-automatic rifles removes this opportunity. Almost all hunters use semi-automatic rifles with the same magazine capacity as my competition handgun. The course that PAL holders are required to take on top of hunter education courses make hunters and competitive shooters safer with firearms than the majority of the population. I am constantly having my background checked as a PAL holder. I have small children. Firearm safety is so very important to me. My firearms are not a public safety threat and neither am I, nor are my teammates, my family and my friends. The measures that this government is taking will destroy competitive shooting sports in Canada. And there are so many more than just the narrow few that make it to the Olympics. And it will destroy our hunting culture to provide for our own families. As Canadians, we are all proud to see a Canadian competing on the world stage, bringing home a medal. That will end in the shooting sports because of the bans put already into place or that are currently being proposed. Removing a tool does not decrease violence. My sports equipment, my hunting tools are not a public safety threat. Thank you very much.
We can hear you right now, uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Keiko. Keiko. Uh, we go now to the Federation Québécois des Chasseurs et les, des Pêcheurs, Monsieur Ren Mr. Marc Renault, President, please go ahead for five minutes. I heard the sound cut off. Did you say it's my turn? Oui, c'est à vous. Yes, it is your turn. Thank you, then. I'm speaking to you today as president of the Quebec Federation of Hunters and Anglers, a non-profit organization whose mission includes representing hunters and anglers and promoting safe practices. Our educational subsidiary, Sécurité Nature, is the provincial government's agent for the delivery of hunter education and the Canadian firearm safety course. Each year, approximately 60,000 participants take our courses. Because we have been teaching safe firearms handling since 1994, when the course was created, we have always focused on education and prevention rather than gun control. We ourselves become involved by going above and beyond our training obligations by implementing safe gun handling awareness campaigns. We've also provided hunters with a website dedicated to gun transportation and storage methods, as well as other actions such as trigger lock distribution. Our overall position on gun control is to limit constraints to legitimate owners, hunters, or sport shooters who are trained and licensed to possess and acquire guns. In response to the concerns about the amendments to Bill C-21 made last November, we raised two main issues. The first is that the amendments as proposed were not clear enough. And the confusion created by the definition of assault weapons and the list of prohibited weapons demonstrates that the control measure didn't hit the right target. Law-abiding hunters, and sport shooters felt a great deal of concern, and rightly so. They felt concern about these prohibition methods that had the potential to include their weapons, which they have used for years for safe and legal activities. The second problem is the lack of public knowledge about firearms, which colors political decisions made about guns. There's evidence that aesthetic and ergonomic criteria are taken into account when placing weapons on the bro prohibited weapons list rather than objective criteria based on the weapons capacity. Furthermore, semi-automatic weapons are seen as military weapons by some, whereas this mechanism is necessary for certain types of hunting. It should be remembered that magazine capacity is already regulated, and in general the limit is five rounds, whereas in the specific case of migratory bird hunting, the limit is three under federal law. We would like to see Canadian regulations that truly target criminals rather than criminalize legitimate firearm owners. The first step would be to create a definition of assault weapon based on objective criteria and not on the style of weapon. And that definition, if accepted by the majority of the hunting and shooting community, should then be applied retroactively to all prohibited weapon schedules. And then it would finally be possible to stop working from constantly revised lists, which is a way of doing a way of doing things that causes anxiety and confusion. So in summary, we strongly believe in education and prevention to promote safe gun behavior. Our members also want to feel safe, and they want the laws that are added to improve public safety to be aimed at the right targets. Hunters and sport shooters who comply with training and licensing requirements are not that target. Thank you. Um, merci. Thank you. Questions now? With uh, Ms. Dancho. Ms. Dancho, please go ahead. Six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank you. Merci to both witnesses for being with us today. Greatly appreciate your your testimony. We have a sports shooting perspective here in this panel and a hunting perspective. So it's a very, very good to hear from both of you. Uh, Ms. Keiko, I have a few questions uh, for you concerning your experience. 
We know, of course, the Liberals have brought forward successive gun bans, uh, certainly began with C-71 and the May 2020 OIC that was subsequently added to with hundreds of models. Uh, we then saw the so-called handgun freeze, which we know is a long-term ban, and now the latest uh, ban, which is um, certainly one of the largest hunting rifle bans in Canadian history. And so now we're talking about that since we've been withdrawn. But what I hear from sports shooters and from hunters is that they feel that they are being punished and attacked. And I'm wondering, as an Olympian who's represented Canada as a sports shooter on two occasions, and from a family of Olympi Olympic sports shooters, I'm wondering if you can share your experience on the impact these successive bans have had on you. Uh, I would say definitely there's a direct, uh, there's a direct impact um, on competitive shooters specifically. Um, again, I, I didn't used to have to do um, a whole stack of extra export and import paperwork to be able to leave the country and come back in the country um, with my own firearms that are registered within this uh, within this country that they have already been imported. I now pay to import them every time I come back and um, back home from a competition. Um, I do know um, one of my teammates um, is is trying to look into avenues to acquire a new competition firearm um, and is receiving significant challenges so essentially like new equipment comes on the market and uh, it has new technology um, better equipment better competition better performance um, and we are now going to be banned from that uh, we're, we're going to have a significant challenges um, if, if at all possible to be able to acquire those um, there's only a very few importers who will even uh, take on the challenge of trying to uh, to work through the rules um, to be able to um, find those exemptions where they're listed for for Olympians. Um, however, being being an Olympian is one thing. I mean, I'm I'm the only pistol Olympian that has attended the last two Olympia Olympics. Um, if we're only talking about um, supporting Olympians, you're talking about supporting me, and that's about it. Um, it means that you ban all of my teammates who are looking to make the Olympics. Um, if we're talking about Olympic sports, there's a huge amount of people who are involved in these sports, but now we're shutting down the opportunities to participate in those sports. Um, we're, we're we're refusing people even the access to the equipment to be able to even try it. So I see, right. I see it as a significant impact. Thank you very much. And just more on that, I think, you know, perhaps folks that don't aren't familiar with firearms at all, they, maybe they think that all guns are just created equal, they're all the same, a gun's a gun, but certainly that's absolutely not the case. And anyone who used firearms at all would know that. And to your point, this is a vital tool, obviously, to competing at the Olympic level. We also have also have IPSC and other uh, international competitive bodies and national competitive bodies. So to your point, if you're not able to sort of, uh, to, you know, hold the firearm before you buy it, if you're not able to uh, buy new parts for it, or it's very difficult to do so, to me, this really seems like it will certainly be an elimination of competitive sports shooting in Canada, something that's been around for a very long time. And certainly the Conservatives are very proud of to see you, Ms. Keiko, as an Olympian representing us on the world stage. So uh, given these restraints, do you feel that there will be more, any more Olympians following you or like, what is the impact this is going to have on Olympic and competitive sports shooting in Canada? Um, considering how hard it is to make the Olympics to, to begin with, I mean, we're, we're talking, I mean, at any Olympic Games, um, there's maybe 300 athletes in the entire country that actually make the Olympic Games. Um, so we're talking about a very small amount of people to begin with. So when we're talking about shooting sports, I mean, you cut off the access to be able to produce Olympian, you need a huge mass of amount of people competing in who push each other to do better, to, to strive for, for better achievements, for better performances. And if you cut off the access to the competition, the training, the teammates, you essentially obliterate any opportunity we have of putting an Olympian into the Olympics, let alone into, onto the podium. You need the opportunity, right. you need the training and availability. And you had, uh, you had mentioned a few countries that compete at the Olympic level in sports. I mean, there's, a, there's many, many of them, but some, can you just list off a few of the top competitors in the world uh, on sports shooting? Um, some of the top competitors um, off the top of my head, there's, um, there's definitely... Um, in, in my event specifically, we've got the Ukraine, um, we've got Greece, uh, we've got South Korea. Um, there's there's definitely, you know, like China's going to be in there as well. Um, some of the other ones that are kind of in the top list are, are probably escaping. Yeah, me, thank you. Throughout the European France as well. 
France and Germany. Yeah, thank you very much. So Canada will no longer be able to compete, in essence, uh, against those other countries that are uh, no. certainly supported by their governments, unlike ours. It's very disappointing, and certainly Conservatives are very proud that you um, have uh, competed at the Olympic level and represented Canada with such pride and integrity. So I just want to put that on the record, how uh, how proud we are of you, Ms. Keiko, thank for you. what it's worth. And just to conclude, uh, a few a few other things. My understanding is, out of all the Olympic sports, that uh, actually sports shooting is, is quite is one of the safest ones. And as well, as you mentioned, um, you know, you, you yourself are not a violent person that you're being treated like you are. So just in our concluding half a minute, can you just comment on a few of those things? Yeah, I think there was there was a study that was done in 2016, and I actually looked if there's a there's a new one that was actually done in 2020 as well that literally listed off statistics of uh, of injuries in different events and different sports. And surprise, surprise, shooting doesn't have any. Um, which I think is a huge testament to the safety culture that we have um, in shooting sports that it's a safety culture. We're always going to be safe and we're not going to have those injuries or incidents that are going to be there. So um, there, there, are, there are studies that are available um, that actually prove that point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dancho. We'll go now to Mr. Moff. Mr. Moff, please go ahead, six minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Keiko, for joining us again uh, and providing us with your testimony. Um, I had a few questions about um, Olympic participation. You're, you participate in the Summer Olympics, and then we also have um, Olympians who participate in, in Winter Olympics in the biathlon. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So of the, of the athletes who attend, the first Olympics we went to was in 1908 how many um how many participate in in pistol shooting with you uh since uh since 1908 i no, like, don't how have the number in front of me that's okay that's okay um but how so how many go to the olympics with you when you go uh so the last two olympics i was the only pistol shooter um previous to that in 2012 um there was only one pistol shooter as well um i think that we've had um, I think that we've had a pistol shooter in the uh, in the Olympics every every summer Olympics. I'm going to say since at least the probably their early 80s when they they kind of split off um, men and women's events. Um, they've definitely had women in every event. I think since uh, 1984, there was even a gold medal at the 1984 Olympics in women's pistol shooting. Um, there's also been a long history of. Uh, male pistol shooters as well. Um, we have, since they changed the rules for how we qualify, there's been smaller shooting teams, I think, since 1996, um, based on how qualifications work. Um, but prior to that, there was a, there, there was a significant shooting teams um, across the rifle, the pistol, and the shotgun disciplines that are available within the shooting sports. Um, and I think I, I could be wrong, but we've been participating as Canada in shooting sports. Um, since the early 1900s, for sure. The, the numbers I got were 16 in pistol shooting and 84 in, uh, in the, in the, um, with long guns. Uh, so we're not talking about a lot of people here, but there is an exemption for elite Olympic shooters like yourself, is there not? Sure there is, but how do you become an elite pistol shooter without training? How do you become an elite pistol shooter... Do do you just come off the street and say, you know what? I think I'm going to be a I'm going to be an Olympic volleyball player today. It takes years of training. It takes years of 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 work and effort to put into it. There's the rule of about 10,000 hours to become a an expert in anything, and yet we're going to limit the people who are allowed to have an exemption to the people who are already champions, who are already winning, who are already Olympians. That means that you get rid of the entire sport. How do you prove that you want to become a a, a professional or Olympian in something before you actually can? prove that you are but but what we're talking about is 16 people um in the entire country and right now it's just you um this You're is talking about 16 people who become an olympians do you understand how right. many other people who have competing against them there's a huge amount of people okay. competing against them we have teams we I, I have teammates that i train with all the time who have not made the olympic level yet but yet you're going to restrict their equipment to, to say that they can never achieve that makes no sense. So, so, it's, it's and like, you know, it's like telling soccer players you, that you can, you want to be a soccer player, but you have to be, you have to be a, an Olympic soccer player before you can actually have a ball. That's well, what you're saying. it's not. I mean, gun ranges are still allowed to import, buy, and sell, um, import and, and buy um, pistols as well. But I, I mean, I, 
I, I, I think, you know, at, at some point, um, we as a, as, as a society need to, to decide which is, which is more important and, you know, with all just, and I, and I do commend you for, for representing your country and, and I thank you for doing that. But, um, we also need to look at as a society, whether handguns are something that we want to see continue to proliferate in, in our country and, and make the decision that, um, you know, you will still have the ability to use them, Ms. Keiko, but, but, you know, our government has determined that, uh, we would like to see a handgun freeze, and that is supported by the vast majority of Canadians from coast to coast to coast. So um, I, I, I think, um, anyway, I'll leave it there because I do want to ask a question to our other witness. Um, is, is there, um, I know that you had concerns about the um, amendment with the list of, of models that, that was put forward. Um, do you know, is there a definition that you think would be helpful in terms of uh, the government if we were to introduce an amendment? I'd better get my earpiece. For um, Monsieur Renaud. Oui, merci. Thank you. And I'll pass a question on to Ms. Lavallee. She's uh, the head of communications. She's in a better position to answer you. Currently, there isn't a definition that we have to propose. What we're asking is that objective criteria be set in order to be able to build that kind of de definition and to be able, and that will include sports shooters and hunters so that that definition is very clear. So we don't necessarily have a final definition to give you ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moff. We'll now move on to Ms. Michaud. Ms. Michaud, go ahead. You have six minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Renault, Ms. Lavallee. Thank you for coming today. I know that uh, hunters in Quebec were very pleased that you were able to provide this testimony. Now, in your opening remarks, Mr. Hono, you were very clear. You said that there were two main problems. First, that the amendments were not clear enough, that is to say G4 and G46. And you also said that there was a lack of knowledge on the part of the public when it came to the categories of firearms. You feel that the criteria that are set or the principles that are used should be objective rather than those that are rather ergonomic in nature. And I'm thinking the same. Is there another way of classifying fire firearms? Francis Langlois, who's a professor, a university professor, proposed something that was rather interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with this way of classifying firearms or it would be based on their on how they're handled and as well as how they are fired so there would be handguns there are long guns when it comes to the handling and then in terms uh, and then in terms of the actual uh, shooting mechanism there are automatic and manual firearms so perhaps if we were to use a different definition, it would be easier for the public to understand exemptions and prohibitions. I'm just wondering if you have an opinion on this. I suggested that we consult what Mr. Langlois has said. So even if the bill is drafted in a particular way, I think it would be interesting to explore this way of classifying firearms. And that way, if there are firearms that are used for hunting for, uh, commonly, that are commonly used throughout Canada, let's say, for example, the SKS, let's say we're talking about uh, firearms that were originally for military purposes but that could be used for hunting, maybe this would allow us to 
figure out how it could be classified without necessarily putting it into a military category. For example, taking the SKS as an example again. So a way of kind of avoiding of putting all firearms in one basket. Well, perhaps I'll attempt a response and then Ms. Vallée can help me. There already are restricted and non-restricted firearms. So I'm wondering about making amendments clearer. You know, there are firearms that are designed as uh, military or high-capacity guns. We, uh, there is already a limit to five rounds, for example, on guns used for hunting. Now, if criteria objective, if objective criteria are used, it would allow the hunters to have a better understanding. They would actually feel more secure in their choices. Because if the amendments are too complicated, then it makes our hunters anxious. There are firearms that are sold in Canada, and they are limited in how many rounds they can have. But perhaps uh, Emily could speak to what you raise regarding the, um, the person you quoted about a way of classifying firearms. Yes, he is suggesting a way of classifying firearms. His, his proposal is actually based on objective criteria, and that's what we're asking for, objective criteria. So I don't necessarily, I can't necessarily say I fully support, but he is using objective criteria. So, for example, in the way they're fired, that is very clear. People know what category their firearm is a part of. So we support that kind of criteria. I think that is something to explore further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Renault, we both agree on one thing. You say that perhaps not having a list would be simpler. And that's what I actually said to the government. If we have this evergreen definition, so a definition that can evolve, well, that definition should cover firearms that exist already that will come onto the market eventually. And perhaps then we wouldn't necessarily need to keep everything on a list. The only list that would be updated would be the RCMP's list, but not necessarily the one that's in the criminal code. To have many lists doesn't help understanding on the part of the public. And if you look at G4, prohibiting firearms that have more than 10,000 joules of power, what that means, or what that refers to, rather, are firearms that are already prohibited. Thank you. I'll continue later. An answer, please. Go ahead. You get to answer. <laughs> well, I, I hadn't asked a question, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'll come back to it later. I hadn't really actually asked a question yet. Sorry, I have this horrible task of cutting people off when t their time is up. So um, we'll go now to... Uh, um, where are we? We'll go now to um, uh, Mr. Julian. Mr. Julian, go ahead, please. Six minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Président. Thank you very much, Cherry. You're doing your job very well. And uh, thank you for for uh, giving me my uh, my opportunity to speak. I'm dealing with some jet lag. Thank you both for your testimony today. It's very important. And I'd like to start with Mr. Renault and Ms. Vallée. First, I'd like to congratulate you on the education you provide. Your website is very informative, and you've quoted some numbers. 
And I want, want to know if I understood correctly, there are 60,000 participants on a yearly basis in your training? That's, uh, yes, that's correct. Well, that's very impressive. So given the impact that you make in terms of education that your organization uh, makes in Quebec, I'd like to know this to begin with. Were you consulted when the bill was being drafted or before the amendments were brought forward? And were you consulted once the amendments were uh, tabled? And I'm referring to G4 and G46. We were not consulted regarding the amendments while they were being drafted. When we saw the amendments, we asked to be heard and to be consulted. And that's why we've also said that if there are uh, potential amendments in the future, there has to be con consultation of all our members. So how were consultations done then after the fact? You pointed out your uh, opinions about the amendments. The NDP, for example, has worked very hard to have these amendments withdrawn. But what I would like to know how you were contacted. How did the government follow up with you once you indicated that the, you had a problem with the amendments? Well, Emily is in the best position to answer this. Perhaps she can answer that question. We were contacted by Minister Medicino's team. We had a meeting uh, mid-January. And in mid-January, when you had this meeting, did you speak about or present this idea of more objective criteria? And did you also raise the two concerns that you raised today in your testimony? For example, the fact that lists aren't clear enough? And did you suggest using objective criteria? Because in your answer to Ms. Michaud, you referred to other criteria that could be used. Was that spoken about? Did you discuss that during your meeting? Yes, we did. However, we first had to ask many questions so that we could actually understand the amendments to make sure that we fully understood the impact of the definitions being used. So that and also so that we could find out what had been added in November 2022. So the purpose of the meeting was to better understand what was being done. Now, if I put myself in the shoes of hunters and sports shooters, well, they didn't attend that meeting. And so it's easy to understand how impossible it would be for them to feel reassured at all about any amendments. So we had an opportunity to get answers to our questions, yes, and then to also raise the issue of a definition that had to be clearer and that the term assault firearms shouldn't necessarily lead to further confusion. And if a definition is accepted after proper consultation, then it has to apply to the entire schedule, to all firearms that have already been prohibited. So if there's an understanding of what that means, then we won't necessarily have to keep working with lists. Was it your impression that the government was trying to convince you about these amendments? Is that why you spent the first part of your meeting mostly discussing, discussing how these would actually work? Well, the purpose of the meeting was not to convince anyone. I think it truly was to seek clarity and to ask our opinion. So it was, a, it was an open discussion on what potentially a definition could include when it comes to assault firearms. And then after that meeting, did the government promise to consult you after, in the future? Well, afterwards, 
they responded in writing to some of the questions that we had that were outstanding. But there were, was no further scheduling of anything, except our testimony here before this committee. How many members do you have? 125,000. And there are 220 associations throughout Quebec that are members, uh, besides all the other community partners. So we are, we are quite an umbrella organization. And out of that, how many are So that wraps up our first round, and we will go now into our second round. Uh, we will start with uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd, please go ahead. It's five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is to the uh, Quebec hunters and anglers. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Lloyd, just before, I, before you can carry on, this will be a shortened uh, round as well. There will be one slot for each, each party, uh, as last time. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, to the Quebec hunters and anglers, Minister Mendicino noted in a previous meeting that he's very concerned with the number of Canadians who are uh, taking safety courses and becoming licensed firearm owners. Are, do you share the Minister Mendicino's concerns uh, that uh, people who are taking your courses and becoming licensed firearm owners pose a threat to public safety? I'm not sure I understood your question. If I understood, you're asking if the minister is worried about the number of people or if you're worried or if I'm worried about the number of people taking safety courses? No. It means that Canadians want to safely use firearms. So, no, on the contrary. Um, you know, it might surprise folks at the committee to learn that I already think there is an evergreen definition of assault firearms in this country. Uh, and that definition has been in place for a number of decades. Uh, firearms that are fully automatic, that carry high-capacity magazines of more than five rounds, are already illegal in this country. Uh, are you aware of that? Is that something that you're aware of? Quebec oui, countries? On est au courant. Yes, we're aware of that. There are prohibited firearms. And there are high-capacity assault firearms that are prohibited. Sport shooters do not have access to these kinds of firearms, assault weapons, today. Is that correct? correct, effectivement. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, they're illegal. Government's evergreen definition that they proposed, they said, quote, a firearm that is a rifle or shotgun that is capable of discharging centerfire ammunition in a semi-automatic manner that is designed to accept a detachable cartridge magazine with a capacity greater than five cartridges of the type for which the firearm was originally designed. Now, I think you and I can agree that we already know in Canada it's illegal to have a magazine that carries more than five rounds, but when this amendment says any firearm that is capable of taking a magazine over five rounds, we're talking about a lot of semi-automatics here. Are we talking about a lot of hunting rifles and shotguns that would be banned by this amendment? Do you agree with that conclusion? On peut pas parler de... Well, we can't necessarily... Anything that's semi-automatic, it doesn't necessarily have to refer to the five rounds. Uh, we're, there is a risk th that some of the firearms that are used, yes, could be included. And that's why we're asking actually for clarity in these amendments. We want them to be more specific. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what my concern about the evergreen definition that the, the Liberals proposed is that it would capture a lot of hunting rifles and shotguns because even though magazines that carry over five rounds or cartridges are illegal in Canada, many of these firearms are designed uh, to take magazines in other countries without these restrictions that would have over five rounds. So many commonly used hunting rifles and shotguns would have been banned if this amendment had gone forward. And that's a concern we have uh, when writing an evergreen definition. And why I don't think it's necessary is because we already have an evergreen definition in this country that bans fully automatic select fire firearms that bans firearms with high capacity magazines and 
uh, this is an evergreen definition that has largely worked, that is politically not divisive in this country overall. And now we're talking about, you know, going after semi-automatic rifles and shotguns that are widely used by hunters, uh, as we've seen from a wide array of testimony. And, and so how does the government try to come back and narrow this evergreen definition? And I just don't think they are capable of doing it because any definition uh, is going to be uh, redundant because it's already going to capture the existing evergreen uh, bans or it's going to capture a lot of legitimately and commonly used hunting rifles and shotguns. This is going to impact a way of life for so many people. Is this going to impact the way of life for folks who go through your courses and folks who are part of your association? Is that going to impact your way of life should these amendments go through again? Yeah, I absolutely agree. In fact, we were surprised by these amendments because legislation already exists. So that's why it really has to be clarified. If the government comes back with amendments... But I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the legislation already exists. Uh, is it is it necessary? Thank you, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, we go now to uh, Mr. Hanley, please. Thank you. Uh, merci pour, uh, uh, Thank you for your testimony. Continue in uh, in English because in this uh, technical uh, category, I have. Uh, I, I'm not as uh, as fluent, so forgive me. But uh, for Monsieur Renault, um, I um, I've I've been engaging uh, quite extensively um, with uh, with uh, Yukon hunters uh, in and uh, many of the themes um, that you relate have been uh, expressed uh, in the Yukon as well. Um, at um, the same time, I, I think um, everyone that I've uh, talked to has uh, has agreed that uh, gun violence in Canada is an increasing problem um, and uh, that uh, um, there is more to do in addressing gun violence in this country. And it's a question of which, which are the avenues uh, that are yet uh, incomplete that we need to uh, complete. I think your, uh, your, the point that you made about, uh, uh, you know, that, that you are probably the most safe users, you and others who are members, who have done the training, who have done the PAL, are uh, among the, um, the most safe users of firearms um, in, uh, in the country. And, and I think we have to, uh, to respect that. At the same time, um, uh, I know when I had a ch was last on this committee, I had a chance to uh, talk with uh, your, Ontario, me, your Ontario counterpart um, and asked uh, about the willingness to engage in the question of how we collaboratively address um, firearm safety and gun violence in, in the country. And um, in your, um, e even when you express that you haven't been consulted enough so far, are you willing to be a partner as we move ahead and try to fill in the gaps in gun safety uh, in this country by working with groups who are uh, working on um, all sides of this issue? Clearly, being consulted is very important. And we're very concerned as well with, with crime. The problem is that we have to be very clear about what we're targeting because obviously it's not the legitimate owners of firearms who need to be targeted because that's not where the problem lies. So what, what needs to be done? Well, if the government wants to work with us as a partner along with other federations, because there are federations throughout the provinces, uh, if we can help, that's fine. But there's also the whole issue of policing and crime and education. So as a federation, we are, we are concerned and that's why we're saying that it's very important to work with and consult hunting communities throughout the country. 
Thank you. Uh, and just um, uh, following up, um, I, I believe in your opening comments that you, you said that you were um, open to a permanent uh, definition, um, as um, M Madame uh, Michaud has uh, followed up on. I also wanted to uh, follow up on um, the, the, the concept of assault-style weapon. We know that, there's, uh, that automatic weapons are covered, uh, but there are concerns about, uh, uh, about, about trying to arrive at some conclusion ar around how we define uh, define firearms that are potential uh, weapons that are not yet um, included. Um, and so uh, you said that you were open to uh, a definition even though you didn't have a criteria uh, yourself to offer. Um, but uh, are there some criteria that you would suggest for how we would arrive at um, an evergreen definition? Effectivement, il y a des critères. Yes, there are criteria that we can suggest, but I should just also say that we're open to creating a definition so that these lists can uh, be removed, because these lists are just going to get longer and longer in subsequent bills, and that's what we want to avoid. So that should be the idea of having a definition so that we can avoid that kind of thing. And that definition could be based on criteria such as those uh, Francis Langlois raised. For example, uh, the charging mechanism, the loading mechanism, or the capacity, and the number of rounds that it can contain. or how it's uh, handled so that handguns, and there can be a distinction between long guns and handguns. So there could be a series of very objective criteria that could be used. Thank you, Doctor. On y va maintenant. I will now move on to Ms. Michaud. Go ahead. You have two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Chair. So here's what I was trying to say earlier. I was I was thinking about G4 and I was trying to read it because I expect that you don't have it in front of you. But from what I understood amongst hunters in Quebec, it's that there's a problem with a point G in the amendment. E and F already refer to firearms that are prohibited under the 2020 OIC. H refers to these ghost guns or firearms that are illegally manufactured. And I think we all agree on the need to legislate. E refers to the schedule. And so I'm just going to refer back to what Ms. Vallée just said. That is to say there shouldn't be long lists. So that should be taken out. But if I go back to G, G refers or referred to semi-automatic uh, semi firearms. And I think the, the, even just the drafting in French led to a lot of confusion. People felt that it meant that all hunting rifles would be banned. But if there were a new definition, if we could just take out this referral in the French version to hunting rifle, do you think that would help? Do you think that would help generally in uh, understanding what is prohibited? Yes, I would say that this notion of um, hunting firearm or hunting rifle, but I think also perhaps other firearms might be added or covered that aren't used in hunting. So I think we need to talk about the design. There has to be a referral to the design. Perhaps Emily has something to add. Well, just to expand on that, I think the, the design is important. And one would have to look at the blueprints to know what is prohibited and what isn't, and that would be impossible. And it would be impossible for a, a regular person to just understand. So we had, and we had raised that point actually when we were meeting with the minister. But to come back to your original question, 
Yes, especially the French version was certainly leading to a fair bit of confusion. I don't know if I have any more time, Chair, but I don't have any more time. Uh, Apologies. Mr. Julian, uh, please go ahead. You have the final word. Two and a half minutes. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Renaud and Ms. Vallée the question that I was asking you earlier when I was cut off by the chair. Now, you referred to 125,000 members. I'd like to know what percentage of those have possession and acquisition licenses. Oh, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you how many have those. License that's licenses. That's uh, a federal matter. It's not information that I have, but all those hunters have licenses, and so I uh, I would expect most of them have the possession acquisition license because they are they have to be the owner of the license and the owner of the firearm. But you would you would say that it's the vast majority, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Because I just wanted to raise another point that was raised earlier, or rather that has been raised by other people in the community and by uh, police officers, and that's the issue of ghost firearms. There are gaps, uh, deficiencies in the legislation. So people can buy parts. They can buy cartridges. They can even own them. And they don't necessarily need to have one of those licenses to own them. So what that means is that any people with criminal intentions can actually circumvent existing laws. You obviously represent an organization that represents responsible uh, members. You take your responsibilities very seriously through the education that you do every year. So I'd like to know what you and and your members potentially think about this in, this increasing phenomena of people managing to acquire these ghost uh, firearms and who are managing to circumvent regulations. That is to say, circumventing the need to have a license. Well, there has to be work with the RCMP. And if a firearms are illegal, well, that's criminal. And so you don't need an amended bill, actually, for hunters and sports shooters if what you're talking about is criminal elements. I mean, that's up to the police, then, to apply uh, the law. Yes. However, the point is that there isn't, uh, it isn't covered. That, that problem isn't covered. That, that law does not exist. Right now, it's legal to buy... Uh, these uh, parts for firearms without having a PAL. Well, you can buy, you can legally buy uh, ammunition under current laws. Now, if you have a firearm that has sort of been made bit by bit and it's illegal, well, that's that's not owner that's not legal ownership you can't legally own one of those and hunters can't either thank you mr julian and i'm afraid we have to wrap up at this point i would like to thank our panel our witnesses you've been very helpful it's a very difficult subject and we appreciate your time and your expertise and um with that i uh, the meeting is now adjourned thank you all <laughs>